already. So what I'll try to, uh, there is so much to be said about the uh, digital technology. Maybe we can, uh, based on what you need, we can have a Q&A. &A. So before I close, let me uh, give a few challenges uh, to adopting digital technology. As I was telling you that we, the data is mostly in the hands of the governments, whether it is Sri Lanka or in India or anywhere else. Say in India, we are developing, we are generating data on Agmarknet because every day we collect data from on different commodities on all the markets of the country. Soil health card, where we issue soil health card to every farmer based on soil sample analysis, huge core data on 12 nutrients of major secondary micronutrients is generated, including organic carbon, on water quality, on pests, on the pesticide dealers, on the prices. So huge amount of data is generated. Now what the problem is that while each of these databases is digitalized, that means the data on soils, data on water, data on prices, data on pest management, data on you know, pest quality uh, check, all kinds of data, these are all in silos. Now, when we have this kind of a silo based data, it does not help an efficient decision support system, whether at the farmer's level or at the policy makers level or at the corporate level, what one needs is, what is the meaning of this mass of data? So if we want these databases to talk to one another, talk to one another, it is very important that all the data is collected on standardized structure basis. That means name structure is same, data standards are same. Only then will one database be able to talk to another database. So what we are now doing is, first is lay down the standards of technology. That means the architecture platforms developed either in the private sector or in the government sector, by the government of India or by the state government, must be all same and they should be able to talk to one another. For example, when we developed ENAM with and connected to REMS, it involved a bit of exercise because REMS was another platform. But when we lay down national standards, it will help everybody to develop same, adopt same architecture, open source data, open access basis platform, and then integration becomes possible. So now what we are doing in our ministry is to develop what is called an agri stack. An agri stack will revolve around every farmer's basic data. As you know, we, in India, we have got 120 million farmers. There are 140 million farm house, uh, farm parcels, and 120 million, that means 12 crore farmers are there. Now, all farmers in India have got a unique identity number, like every other resident in the country. That means 130 crore people in our country have got unique identity number, what is commonly called Aadhaar, which is a biometric based Aadhaar. So now using this unique identity of every farmer, the land data, the crop data, the soil data, and all other data will be now brought onto one single platform. And that will be a centralized database. That process has already begun. Now it is easy, quite easy for us to do because we already have, for example, a soil health card data for all the farmers. And when last year we government launched what is called PM Kisan, Pradhan Mantri Kisan, where every farm the farmer gets rupees six thousand per annum as a supplementary income support. Now that income was transferred through a direct benefit transfer. That means with the with since we have a centralized database of farmers and he has got an Aadhaar number and then another advantage was that his account number, bank account number was also seeded onto this particular database and the mobile number was seeded onto the database constituting what is called a trinity of mobile, unique identity number, Aadhaar and Jandhan account or what is the, the acronym called as JAM in India, Jandhan account, Aadhaar number, mobile. So these three now together help us to transfer his entitlement through one bank across these 12 crore farmer accounts. Now, why is this possible? 
because one bank sitting in delhi for example can talk to the database of any other bank a farmer could be having his account in any number of banks in one village they could be having in canara bank in another in state bank of india in another in dena bank there could be icici bank hdfc bank but then the single window will be one bank at delhi but it is able to distribute the money to different banks to different account holders so this direct benefit transfer will call for interoperability of the databases it will call for data operability uh, of a standardized data structure so now this centralized database that is being developed in our department and agri stack using the digi stack will then help us to accurately pinpoint the farmer and all the subsidies and entitlements whether it's on seed or on fertilizer or on water or on the sale minimum support price all of that can be then transferred and that can actually enable us to move from kind subsidy to cash subsidy as you know today the world over a lot of debate is going on around whether we should shift from you know in a price support system to the income support the basic income support so if which means that if any country adopts that income support scheme it says all right this is your entitlement i am giving you now you decide whether you want to grow sugar cane or plantation or jowar or rice or whatever you want to grow so more importantly that it helps you to have honesty accuracy and prop efficiency in delivery otherwise there can be a lot of corruption in the system the intermediaries can spoil the system so dbt is what is going to is is the order of the day government of india has been able to save the last time i read in the newspaper was that government of india has been able to save rupees 2.7 lakh crore because of adopting direct benefit transfer in different departments social welfare welfare physically challenged schemes student scholarships you know anything or lpg when lpg today is based on dbt so dbt is something which will be possible once you have a digital platform for all the data and information and the standardized data structure and interoperability of applications and platforms so i was telling you that challenges this is basic challenge we should be able to therefore strengthen and deepen our broadband and where in the remote areas broadband may still have a challenge last mile connectivity has to be ensured and then see how the people have access to infrastructure internet infrastructure or smartphones and also the call centers for direct interaction uh, so that the repetitive nature of data can be transmitted interactive system can be brought in where we need to have a dialogue with the farmers or when you need to convert text into image so many time you need to convert the text into image for let's say you want to identify weed amidst the crop what is a weed and what is a crop we should be able to have a imagery system so i think going forward there are still a lot of challenges but sri lanka which is keen to develop a digital technology for agriculture with a very right objective and right vision can certainly do it because your farmers are already highly educated are literate now you need to impart them electronic literacy financial literacy and then of course strengthen this particular digital platforms and integrate different technologies the basic ict platform with the remote sensing technology with the emerging technologies and then we will be able to i think ensure that we are able to share real time data with the farmers help them negotiate the risks and simultaneously take decisions on what to produce when to produce when to sell where to sell and become part of the agricultural value system both domestic as well as uh, global system so i think i will uh, stop here uh, though there are uh, many many things to be uh, talked about uh, but maybe through the q and a we can actually uh, uh, come to this thing thank you and uh, i just take this opportunity of talking a bit about aadhaar you know because i think aadhaar has been the basis for accuracy of delivery of the goods and services uh some of you may be already knowing but for many who may not know this was launched in the year 2010 by government of india aadhaar in our languages means foundation anchor but its uh, uh, technical name is uidai unique identity 
unique identification number. Now, it is a unique identification number because it is based one number given to a particular person will not be given to anybody else. And the algorithm adopted is such that for the next 100 years, we are not going to fall short of any number. Second, a number given to one person will end with his death. That means that number will not be used anywhere by anybody else, even after he passes away. Third, it is unique in the sense that it is based on biometrics. It uses three biometrics. It uses the fingers, fingerprints, uses the profile picture, and the iris. Iris is very unique. In fact, it is more unique than the fingerprints. And based on these three biometrics, every resident of the country is given a biometric is given a unique identity number because the biometrics is collected at one center. It is then uh, sent to the data center where it is at it is deduplicated. That means it analyzed for deduplication. That means that fingerprint should not tally with any other number given so far as of that day. If no number has been assigned to that package of biometrics, then he gets one random number. It is a random number, not in a series. And that is how India has now been able to identify every person. And we rely upon names. I am Ashok Dalvai. There could be somebody who is Ashok uh, Janta, Ashok De Silva. So how do you distinguish between two of us? And we found in our country, as anywhere else, that the same person is getting two pensions or he was claiming two entitlements. I have got many examples to show how once the Aadhaar number was given and that was linked to the direct benefit transfer scheme, the deduplication started happening. So somebody who was getting two scholarships now had to get to, has to satisfy himself to only one. So that's how the government of India has been able to save huge amount of money which possibly was being wrongly going to people. Or some people who are not getting are now getting because they are identifiable. And the last point is, you know, India's unique identity number is unique truly compared to any other country in the world. You all heard of social security number of America. America has had it for long, many decades. Many countries like including Mexico, Brazil have these numbers. But you know, if you go to these countries, I've gone there and seen, their numbers are having some basic intelligence. That means if you go to Mexico, for example, and ask a person for his identity number, you'll find that you can easily say from which state he comes, which province he comes, which district he comes, what language he speaks. Now, India has been very neutral. It does not build any intelligence. Therefore, it's called a dumb number. It is a dumb random identity number. You cannot make out what religion he belongs to, what, what state or province he belongs to. And you and I may go continue once to the enrollment center, but you will get some number, I'll get some other number. It's not in a series. And this identity number, I think, is something which, you know, which helps in several things. And it is all meant for welfare activities. It is not meant for regulation in our country. It is not meant for regulation. It is a welfare-oriented identity number. So all kinds of now entitlements from the government, etc., are now being transferred, and therefore this uh, the DBT is becoming more and more successful. Thank you.